If you have your Bible, turn to 2 Kings chapter 4. We're going to start at verse 8. And uh, before I read, I hope we're going to start bringing our Bibles to church. I'm going to leave on vacation, friends. I'm going to be gone for a month. And when I get back in August, I'm counting. Everybody's going to have a Bible. When we get here in August, it's going to be people just going through their Bible. Because it's important that you read uh, the word for yourself. All right. Here's this long story. Elisha and a woman from Shunem. We're going to start at verse 8. We're going to read all the way through 37. One day, Elisha went to the town of Shunem. A wealthy woman lived there, and she urged him to come to her home for a meal. After that, whenever he passed that way, he would stop there for something to eat. She said to her husband, I am sure this man who stops in from time to time is a holy man of God. Let's build a small room for him on the roof and furnish it with a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp. Then he will have a place to stay whenever he comes by. One day, Elisha returned to Shunem, and he went to his upper room to rest. He said to his servant, Gehazi, tell the woman from Shunem I want to speak to her. When she appeared, Elisha said to Gehazi, tell her, we appreciate the kind concern you have shown us. What can we do for you? Can we put a good word for you into the king or to the commander of the army? No, she replied. My family takes good care of me. Later, Elisha asked Gehazi, what can we do for her? Gehazi, the servant, replied, she doesn't have a son, and her husband is an old man. Call her back again, Elisha told him. When the woman returned, Elisha said to her as he stood in the doorway, next year at this time, you will be holding a son in your arms. No, my Lord, she replied. Oh, man of God, don't deceive me and get my hopes up like that. But sure enough, the woman soon became pregnant. And at that time, the following year, she had a son, just as Elisha had said. Now, breaking the story. Make sure we're at the same place. A lot that we need to break down, can't do it all. But here's the gist of the story. is a wealthy woman from Shunem. She's married to a man who's an older man. She doesn't have children He is unable, apparently, to bring forth a child in this woman's life. She lives in Shunem, which is on the eastern edge of the Jezreel Valley. Jezreel Valley is the grain breadbasket for all of Israel. I mean, this is where tons of wealth was held. They would plant barley and wheat and harvest it all through the Jezreel Valley. On the Jezreel Valley are the towns of uh, Megiddo, Shunem, Mount Moray, Mount Tabor. I mean, this is the hotbed. And when you read about the, the center of the northern kingdom, Israel, this is the place that we're talking about. Now, this is very important. She was a wealthy woman. And this was the time where the prophets would kind of just come through the area. The prophets had a rough life because they were called to speak God's word, speak truth to power, Okay. Now, we think about that. Well, that's it's kind of a popular saying in the 21st century, right? That's what all kind of the, the mantra of social justice in our era, right? Speak the truth to power. Speak the truth to power. And so we do that sometimes. We speak the truth to power. And then once the day is done, we go home and drink a latte on our comfortable couch and watch Jeopardy, right? On a 70-inch screen TV, right? Prophets? That's not what it was like. When they spoke the truth to to Ahab, the wicked king of Israel, they were fleeing for their life. I mean, they were holed up in caves. They had to hide out. It was danger city for them. Elisha is one of these guys. Now, Elisha is the, 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 the guy that comes after Elijah. We can't get into all of that right now. But Elisha, man, he's picked on everywhere he goes. In fact, you remember the, the scripture about Elisha? He walks in and speaking prophetically. And, and you remember what they called him? Old bald head, right? Here comes old bald head, right? Elisha is rejected everywhere by the people, by the politi- political figureheads, by the kings, by everybody. But here's this woman in Shunem. And she says, come to my house, eat dinner. And she must have been a good cook because every time he came through, he came back to her home for a meal. You understand what I'm saying, right? So this woman who has the house says to her husband, if 
have you heard this guy speak? I mean, have you heard the word of God that this man brings? Let's get that. And let's bring it central to who we are. So let's build a, a guest house for him, an upper room for him on the top of our house so that when he comes through, he'll stay here. And that, that, that dripping of the Holy Spirit just pours off of him. Now, I want to say something to you real quickly. Elisha was the one who followed Elijah. You remember Elijah? He was the one that was, he was the prophet that was such a man of God that he didn't ever die here on earth. Remember, he was taken up to heaven in a... Okay, well, I heard a fiery Corvair, but okay, fair enough, fiery chariot, right? He was taken up in a, in a fiery chariot. That's a, but, but Elisha, before Elijah leaves, he looks at Elijah and he says, this is the one thing that I want from you, Elijah. Give me a double portion of your spirit. Give me a double portion of who God is in you. And before I go out and serve as prophet, before, as I'm, before I have to speak the truth to power, before I know I'm going to be rejected by the kings and nobility, before I just enter this life of rejection and, and really tough ministry, give me a double portion of your spirit inside of me. And then Elijah takes his mantle and he lies, lays it on Elisha's shoulders and pours that double blessing on him. And then Elijah goes, and now it's on Elisha. Understand that where Elisha went, God's spirit preceded him, came with him, and followed behind him. In other words, wherever Elisha went, God just poured out of him. Have you ever been around somebody like that? I mean, have you been around somebody where you go, man, you don't even have to speak. I just want to be near you. Because when I'm near you, I feel like I'm near God. You're just so full that the drippings that just naturally overflow, I just want to have a cup next to you and catch that. Let me just say one thing and then we'll move forward. Number one, when you find somebody like that, get really close. Get really, really close. The book of Proverbs says it this way. Listen, don't ever forget this. Those who walk with the wise become wise themselves, but a companion of fools encounters much harm. Can I say it again? Those who walk with the wise become wise, but a companion of fools encounters much harm. You know, when I find a really great preacher, when I find a really great pastor, when I find a, a really godly person, I want to saddle up with them. Because it's right, right? Because why? They're going to take me with them. I'm going to be on a faith journey with them. And where they go, I want to go too. Because there's going to be godly pasture. There's going to be godly nutrition. There's going to be godly stuff that happens. And I just want to soak up that same stuff. Those who walk with the wise become wise. There's a bunch of young folk right here. And I'm going to tell you this. This is some of the best advice that you're ever going to get. If you can connect yourself with other people who have like-minded, godly worldviews, when it comes to dating, when that comes to marriage, when that comes to Friday night, when that comes to hanging out on the weekend, when you connect yourself with people who are godly, with people who are wise, with people who choose the right, you also will experience the right. I mean, it's just critically important. The backside of that is equally true. But a companion of fools encounters much harm. I mean, hear that. You jump into a car with somebody who's been making colossally bad choices, foolish choices. You are now trapped in a car with someone who's not only made bad choices, but has your future dictated with their hands and feet. So this woman in Shudem says, Elisha, I'm going to build you a room. And I'll put it upstairs so that when, when God's spirit drips out of you, it'll come through the ceiling, right? And pour into my home right here. All right, that's the story. Now the second half. Oh, I forgot to talk about this. 
So Elisha's grateful, right? He says, I'm grateful. What can I do for you? Do you want me to put in a good word with, the, with one of the, the generals of the military? It's always, it's just constant war, especially in the Jezreel Valley. Because it's such a breadbasket and because the resources are so wealthy, everybody's constantly fighting to take control of the Jezreel Valley. Everybody wants control. So he says, do you want me to get, get the, the, the military general to post a, a guard for you here at your house to watch your crops and fields? We can put a battalion of soldiers here. I just want to thank you for what you've done. And she says, no, I'm completely and totally content. I'm content just simply to catch the droppings of God from you. I'm content just to have you come in and speak God's word. I am content and completely wrapped up inside of who God is. It's a challenge for me. I don't know about you. When was the last time you were just completely and totally content in who God was? You didn't need anything else. You didn't need fame. You didn't need popularity. You didn't need a resource. You didn't need a mass wealth. Just simply content in who God is. And so Elisha says, okay. But then later on, his servant Gehazi says to him, hey, Elisha, I heard that. You know that woman doesn't have any children, right? And her husband's really old. Maybe a baby might be in order for that family. Maybe you speak to God and maybe she becomes pregnant. Have you ever noticed in the Bible how many miraculous conceptions are taking place over and over and over again, right? So sure enough, a year later, she becomes pregnant. Now the second half of the story. Verse 18, one day when her child was older, he went out to help his father who was working in the harvest with the harvesters. Suddenly he cried out, my head hurts, my head hurts. His father said to one of the servants, carry him home to his mother. So the servant took him home and his mother held him on her lap. But around noontime he died. She carried him up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, then shut the door and left him there. She sent a message to her husband, send one of the servants and a donkey so that I can hurry to the man of God and come right back. Why go, he asked. It is neither a new moon festival or a Sabbath. But she said, it will be all right. So she saddled the donkey and said to the servant, hurry, don't slow down unless I tell you to. As she approached the man of God at Mount Carmel, Elisha saw her in the distance. He said to Gehazi, look, the woman of Shunem is coming. Run out to meet her and ask her if everything is all right with you, your husband, and your child. Yes, the woman told Gehazi, everything is fine. But when she came to the man of God at the mountain, she fell to the ground before him and caught, him, caught hold of his feet. Gehazi began to push her away, but the man of God said, leave her alone. She's deeply troubled, but the Lord has not told me what it is. Then she said, did I ask you for a son, my Lord? And didn't I say, don't deceive me and don't get my hopes up? Listen to this. Then Elisha said to Gehazi, get ready to travel. Take my staff and go. Don't talk to anyone along the way. Go quickly and lay the staff on the child's face. But the boy's mother said, as surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I won't go home with you. I won't go home unless you go with me. So Elisha returned with her. Gehazi hurried ahead and laid the staff on the child's face, but nothing happened. There was no sign of life. He returned to meet Elisha and told him the child is still dead. When Elisha arrived, the child was indeed lying there on the prophet's bed. He went in alone and shut the door behind him and prayed to the Lord. Then he went and laid down on the child's body, placing his mouth on the child's mouth, his eyes on the child's eyes, and his hands on the child's hands. And as he stretched out on him, the child's body began to grow warm again. Elisha got up, walked back and forth across the room once, then stretched himself out again on the child. This time the boy sneezed seven times and he opened his eyes. Then Elisha summoned Gehazi, call the child's mother, he said. When she came in, Elisha said, here, take your son. She fell at his feet and bowed before him, overwhelmed with gratitude. Then she took her son in her arms and carried him downstairs. Now, Unbelievable story. 
Hey, say amen if you're with me at the end of the story. You got it so far, amen? Okay. Now, this is a blockbuster story, and, and that's why we're telling it, because we're in the season of blockbusters, but I'll be honest with you, to me, the blockbuster of this story is not the end of the story. I mean, it is really unbelievable. A kid dies, Elisha comes back and breathes into the kid, and he comes back to life, and, and, and maybe someday we'll look at that part of the story. You know what I really want to look at? I think the blockbuster part of this story really comes in verse 9. Let me read it to you again. The woman from Shunem said to her husband, I am sure this man who stops in from time to time is a holy man of God. Let's build a room for him on the roof and furnish it with a bed, a chair, a table, and a lamp. Then he will have a place to stay whenever he comes by. I'm going to take 10 more minutes but I want you to hear very important what I'm about to say. In the first, the the ancient Bible, in the biblical times, houses weren't like houses that we have today. In fact, if you were gonna build a guest room at your house, here's what you'd do. You'd often maybe get some, some, some wood and some thatched kind of stuff and you might put together a little lean-to next to your house. And it would be a place where if someone was coming by, they could spend the night in, get out of the shade, get into the, in, under the shade, and get out of the heat and the sun. When you're not there, it would be a place where goats and, and sheep, if the weather was bad, could come in and, and, and kind of hunker down in the midst of bad weather. It might be a place where you'd store things that you could have. It would be a very shambly, small type of a room just off to the side of the house, much like a tent. This woman meets Elisha. And then she sits down across from him for a meal. And she starts hearing about God. Now, she was Jewish. She had grown up hearing the stories of God. She had, she had heard it. But something took place when, when, when Elisha started telling her. And the story of God took hold of her heart so much. So listen, that it didn't just make a small dent on who she was. It completely transformed her entire outlook. She said to her husband, let's go up on the rooftop and make a room for Elisha. Do you have any idea how much expense would have been involved for her to go up on the second story and build a roof up on there? That probably meant they had to come in, reinforce their own individual rooftop. Build a second structure up on top. Why up on top? Because in the Jezreel Valley, especially on the eastern side, that whole Jezreel Valley is banked off from all of the winds that come from the Mediterranean Sea by Mount Carmel and the whole range right there next to the Mediterranean Sea. There is hardly any wind that comes through the Jezreel Valley. It is hot and warm. And so she says to her husband, let's build a house on the second story. Let's, let's just break the bank and get this man an unbel- not a place where, where cattle and sheep are going to come, not just some kind of shabby lean-to, but let's get a really, really wonderful place built for him that we can open up and ventilate. Let's put in there a bed, a chair, a table, and a lamp. Beds were extravagant pieces of furniture. Most people slept on a bedroll. And in a few weeks, you're going to hear the story about a man on a mat. People didn't have Sealy posturepedics, right? It was basically a glorified rug that in the daytime was rolled up and leaned in the corner because they didn't have separate bedrooms from living spaces. They were simply rolled up and put into the corner. Instead of just making another extra little space, they built him a room, put in a bed 
so that the, the, there would be great comfort for the message of God to be received in that house. They put in a table and a chair and a lamp so that in the evening when, when, when Elisha would come by, he would be able to have a place that, that was ventilated. He could sit and pray and he could read through scrolls and he could spend his time with his, 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 his work that was there so that even at night the message of God would be able to flow through Elisha. She could have. Listen, I know I'm hammering this. She could have made a very basic place for Elisha. But I don't think this woman was interested in bare minimums. I think her heart was engulfed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it turned her heart into radical hospitality because it appears that that's her gifting but she didn't just do what it took. She was all in. Can I tell you what I think is killing the 21st century church? I'm going to be real honest with you. And I'm not talking Broad Street. I'm talking about the church, especially the Western church. Bare minimums. I think that's totally true. You know what I think we think of church? If I get my 60 minutes in, if I take some money out of my pocket and put it into an offering plate, and then every once in a while, I'll say a prayer, typically, rub-a-dub-dub, thanks for the grub, yay God, I've nailed it, right? I've hit the, the minimum bar for my Christian walk, for my faith. Can I tell you a secret? That's not the bare minimum. <laughs> That's not the bare minimum. Do you know what the bare minimum is? Listen to me real carefully. Here's the bare minimum. I received Jesus Christ into my heart, and I accepted the gift that he died for me, and now my sins are forgiven, and so my name has been written in the Lamb's book of life for eternity. That, that's the bare minimum. And to be honest with you, you don't have to do anything else. You really do. I, I know the Bible says faith without works is dead and I get all of that kind of stuff. But the truth is there is nothing that we can do in order to earn our salvation. The bare minimum is that which Christ has already done for us. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, he's bringing out the fruit of repentance inside of us. The shame of it is, is we want to live by some kind of legalistic rubric that says we have to do this, we have to do this, and we have to do this. And if I get those boxes checked off, I'm an adequate Christian and it's enough to get by. You know what's happening to the church? You know what's happening to the kingdom? It's just disintegrating. And there's pieces and chunks and more importantly, people that are just falling to the wayside. Because we, myself at the head of the list, I'm not pointing at anybody, me too, at the head of the list, are living lives of bare minimums. If we can do enough to check the box, then I've gotten it done. Let me see if I can illustrate this really painfully. The truth is, it comes down to this scale in our life. What do we value? Like, what do we really value, and what do we not? What's really important to us and what is our worldview? What drives us and what is secondary or tertiary or down the list? My son Thomas plays baseball. And this weekend, he's playing on one team that's in the Cleveland World Series, which means there's eight little teams playing together and they call it World, Ser World Series, uh, you know, whatever. He's playing on another team that's playing over in Harrison in the state championship, which means that there's eight teams playing together there and they're calling it the state championship, right? Now, here's the question. What do I value more? My son's baseball or my walk with Christ? Well, on Friday night, our family loaded up into the car. We drove over to Harrison. We spent three hours at a baseball field. 
We, we watched, we played, we had a great time. I helped coach, we came home. We got home that night, and as soon as we got home, we took out bags, we repacked, got new uniforms in, got new stuff all together, and then we came out here to Cleveland. Guess what I did Saturday morning? Our truck was loaded with a big blue wheelie cart that I had purchased in order to carry our equipment for the game from our car to the field. Inside of that cart is four beach chairs, a giant Yeti cooler, filled with ice chests because we're going to be there from 9 in the morning until 8 at night. On top of that are two Ryobi battery-powered fans that will sit there and blow cool air on us as we sit there through 12 hours of scorching heat. Underneath, a 10-foot by 10-foot academy-tarped tent that will go over our head. Oh, by the way, we also purchased a 36-inch barn fan. It sits this tall on the ground, has two wheels on the backside of it, a handle that I pick up and drag all the way down to the boys' dugout because they might get hot. I'm not joking. I wish I had a picture to show you. The problem is this, that there isn't power at the dugout. So I have 500 feet of drop cord that I run all the way back. But there's other parents that have bought barn fans too. So I have a six pin surge bar that we can all plug into and plug into the single point of power so that I can have their fan and they can have their air conditioner. Oh, by the way, when that game's over, We'll load back up into the truck and go to Harrison and do it that night. And then I asked myself, when was the last time I was that vested in the kingdom? I mean, really. When was the last time that I loaded up a cart, purchased a drop cord, so that the people that walk right past our campus know Jesus. So that the hungry people right down these streets feel fed and loved. So that I shared the the story that there is an answer to addiction in Christ. To where I loved somebody who was lonely and I even took 15 minutes and a loaf of bread and went to my neighbor who hasn't had a person visit him in over a month. When was the last time that I did that? You see, I am great at checking the boxes and doing the base level, the the minimum requirements for Christianity. But boy, am I invested in a lot of other things and heavily. I don't think bare minimums are what the kingdom calls us to. Do you know what our brothers and sisters in Korea do? Listen, you want to hear this? Sean, you're shaking your head, aren't you? Tell me if I'm wrong on this. Do you know they wake up at four in the morning? The church in Korea wakes up at four in the morning and they walk to their church. And then they pray from 4.30 until 7. (laughs) They pray from like 4.30 to 7. And then you know what they do? They go to work. You know what they do after work? They walk back to their church and they pray. Because their entire life is wrapped up in in faith. Oh, by the way, one of the fastest growing churches in the entire world is in Seoul, South Korea. 2.5 million members. That's a large sanctuary. Amen. We got to close up. But I I want to talk to us as Broad Street. We have to make a decision, friends. It's time. Are we going to be a church that just gets by? We're going to do the bare minimum? And if we do, I'm going to tell you, then my job is going to change from pastor to chaplain. And I'll be the chaplain, and I'll serve for the funeral of our church. 
because we'll die over the next 10 to 15 years. We will become so culturally irrelevant. And our older members will go to be with Jesus and we'll be left with a handful of people that can never sustain this place, much less a campus at Johnston Woods and a campus at Unity Center. So that great, wonderful camp out there, that'll go away. The great ministry that we do just at God Street, just a mile from here, that'll all be gone. And our impact, our global impact for Christ, Or will we say bare minimum isn't good enough? And I'm going to start praying like it makes a difference. I'm going to start worshiping like it makes a difference. I'm going to start serving like it makes a difference. I want to give you a challenge next week. I'm going to give you a challenge right now. Next week. (laughs) I'm going to be on vacation. Sorry. (laughs) Next week, VBS starts on Sunday. I know not everybody can teach and be involved in VBS. I get that. You know what Jesse said to us this morning? This is what Jesse said. She said, I need a bunch of people next Sunday after church. I need a bunch of people next Sunday after church. You don't have to teach. You don't have to shepherd. You know what you have to do? You have to hang up posters and put up cray paper and uh, I don't know, Ethan, what all the decorations are. Just set up, right? We just need to get set up so the kids can hear about Jesus. My challenge is this. If you don't teach Sunday vacation Bible school, and if you're not going to shepherd vacation Bible school, I'm going to challenge your, you and your family to stay here Sunday after church and help Jesse set up for vacation, to prepare this place for the gospel for young people, to make a difference for them. She said there's going to be pizza afterwards, right? Right, see, there's somebody signing up. I got to close. I wish we could talk longer, and I wish I could get some feedback from you. That's what I really wish. But here's the question. Are we going to be like the Shunammite woman and give up, you know, the sake of luxury, the sake of excess, the sake of opulence, for the sake of the kingdom? Can we move past those bare minimums so that all may know God's love through Jesus? The scripture today will come from 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. You'll find the scripture on page 334 of the Pew Bibles. One day, Elisha went down to the town of Shuman. A wealthy woman lived there, and she urged him to come to hear her home for a meal. After that, whenever he passed that way, he would stop there for something to eat. She said to her husband, I am sure this man who stops him from time to time is a holy man of God. Let's build a small room for him on the roof and furnish it with a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp. Then he will have a place to stay whenever he comes by. This is the word of God for the people of God. Please be seated. Good morning. It's so good to be with y'all with you all this morning, with y'all this morning. I'm I'm from here, so I know how to say that. My name is Reverend Betsy Schweitzer, and uh, it's a blessing to see all of you here today. I know it's a holiday weekend, but I thank you for your faithfulness in being here this morning. Um, I am excited to say that today is my one year, year anniversary as your as your associate pastor, and I'm so glad to be here. Um, <laughs> I I thank you. I was not looking for applause, but I just want to say, I I can't say it enough how you all have made me feel so at home here, and it does feel like home, and I thank you for that. I also forgot to mention this at the early service, but I want to recognize Luann Holden, who is filling in for uh, for Cynthia this week, and we appreciate you being here and doing what a beautiful job you're doing, too, and I know our choir appreciates that as well. We are blessed to have such a wonderful choir, aren't we? wonderful musicians in this church. Um, it's, a, it's a special day today, and it's good to be here. It's good to be with you all. 
We have started a sermon series this summer called our Summer Blockbuster Series, uh, kind of a, a movie theme, not based around movies, but, but that idea of, of these heroes, uh, heroes of faith, as, as we would call them. And we've tried to pick ones that, that were maybe not so familiar, that we don't typically preach about very often. And today is one of those. In fact, many of you may not know this story. Some of you may know a little bit about it. Some of you may know it, but, but I imagine many are not that familiar with the story today. This story about a Shunem, a woman from Shunem, or a Shunemite woman, as we call her. Uh, that's what you might hear this story referred to, the story of the Shunemite woman. Shunem, let me give you just a little bit of background here, and then I'm going to tell you the story. Shunem was just a few miles north of Jezreel. I wish I had a map that I could show you what I'm talking about here, but but it was a town that was located on the main route that was between Nazareth and Jerusalem. It was the route that everyone would take and travel as they would go between those two places. And, and so it was a very busy area, a very busy place. And, and this morning's hero that we're going to talk about, this woman from Shunem, lived with her husband right there on that route where they could see everyone coming and going the scripture tells us that, that she was a wealthy woman. She was a wealthy woman. Uh, interestingly enough, different from what we think of today, back then a wealthy family would live at the base of the mountain, at the base of the mountain so they wouldn't have to walk back up and, up and down the mountain. As opposed to living on Lookout Mountain now or Signal Mountain, um, where those, that's where the wealthy people would live. Uh, so it was a little different back then. They lived right there at the base of that mountain, right on that road where they could see everyone coming and going. Now this region, uh, this Jezreel Valley that they lived around, was considered the breadbasket for that region. And so they were very possibly wheat farmers. They were very possibly owned some of the grain fields. And so that's probably where their wealth came from. They, we do know, though, that they were well-to-do. Her home was situated right, right there, and it allowed her to do some people watching. Anybody like to do people watching? We used to go to the mall and watch people and, and, and uh, try to decide what their story was, you know, and make up these great little ideas. But, but when you people watch, you always find interesting characters, don't you? You always find these interesting characters. And, and so one of those interesting characters happened to pass by this home, and this character was named Elisha. You may have heard of Elisha. You may know who Elisha is. Elisha was the prophet that followed Elijah. Sort of, Elijah sort of mentored Elisha. And, and when Elijah died, or when Elijah was taken up to heaven by the chariots, a double portion of his blessing was put on Elisha. And Elisha became the prophet that everyone knew at that time, the greatest prophet at that time. So this woman likely struck up a conversation with him and, and sure many others as, as they would walk by. But there was a connection that happened between these two. Maybe she already knew something about him. Maybe some other passers-by had, um, had told her the stories of the, about this man, Elisha. And whatever, she did make this connection. Somehow she was drawn to him. So on this particular day, the Shunammite woman urged Elisha to come into her home for a meal. She invited him in. She reached out in hospitality and invited him to come into her home. And from that point on, this friendship developed. And every time Elisha was in the area, he would come. He would come to her home and he would have something to eat with, with this woman and her husband. In these encounters, the Shunammite woman must have sensed something deeply religious about this man. And she really felt connected. She wanted to stay connected to him. So one day she goes to her husband and she says, you know, I'm, I'm sure that this man who stops in from time to time is a holy man of God. Let's build a room for him. Let's go up on top of our roof and let's build a room for him, but not just a room, let's furnish it. Let's put a bed in it, a table in it, a chair and a lamp. Let's make it ready for him. 
Then when he comes, he will have a place to stay. Well, Elisha was surely blessed by the kindness and the hospitality of this woman. So much so that one day he approached the woman to inquire if there was something that he might do for her, something special he might do for her. He mentioned that he had considerable influence with Israel's king and he would be happy to give a good word on her behalf. But you know, this wealthy woman, her motives were pure. This this wealthy woman was content with her life. Her offerings to Elijah were were sincere. She, She wanted nothing in return. She just wanted to extend a hand of friendship to him to this holy man. Certainly, she wanted to be in his presence to learn from him and to discuss things of faith with him, but she expected nothing in return, and she quickly refused his offer of help. But that didn't satisfy Elisha. He felt that he needed to do something. He needed to repay this kindness. So so he asked his servant Gehazi, Gehazi uh, was, was with him, and he asked him to come there and, and, and tell him what he might do for this woman. Well, Gehazi points out the obvious to him and reminds him that this woman and her husband have no son. In fact, they have no children at all. And it was as if a divine light bulb switched on in Elisha's head As a spokesperson for God, he felt a message in his spirit and it compelled him to speak to this woman again. He said to Gehazi, call her back here. Call her back. I need to talk to her. So Gehazi brought this woman back to Elisha and Elisha made an unimaginable promise to her. He said, this time next year, you will be holding your son in your arms. Now, I imagine that, that she must have been stunned by this proclamation that he made. Was he teasing her? And if he was, what a cruel, cruel joke. Because by this time, by this point in her life, she had convinced herself that, that it was okay that she had never had any children. She was grateful for her husband and for their blessed life. But just the mention of a child must have brought up all of those desires that she had stuffed down for years and all of the disappointments too. It's such a blessing to have Zachary in our service, our newest newest addition to Broad Street United Methodist Church. And I had such a blessing to get to go over and hold him uh, at their home this week. And oh, just what a great feeling. And it reminded me of what it must have felt like. Now, they're the typical age of people that would have babies. but, But this couple, wow, what that must have meant to them to have this child that they never dreamed they would ever have. Well, this woman is incredulous when, when Elisha tells her this. And he look, she looks at him and she says, No, my Lord. Oh, man of God, don't deceive me and get my hopes up like that. But you know, prophets, as I said before, deliver messages for God. And sure enough, a year later, she had that baby. She had that child, that son, that gift in her arms, just as Elijah had said. The Shunammite woman and her husband must have been overcome with joy as they held that son of their old age. It it just takes you back to other stories that we remember, stories like Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Rebekah. I can just imagine her holding that crying baby and her heart filled with joy and hope, comforting him. This was no cruel cruel joke after all. Elisha was right all along. And oh, what a blessing, she thought. A dream come true. Well, when the boy was a little older, he did what many children do. He went to work with his father one day. 
And on this particular day, he went out into the fields with his father. And it must have been a pretty hot day. Because after a little while, all of a sudden, the boys began to scream and cry, my head hurts, oh, my head hurts. The father didn't think much of it. He just found one of his workers and asked him to take him back home to his mother. But once that child arrived at home, his mother took him in her arms and, and began to rock him and hold him as mothers do, trying to comfort him and praying over him that God would heal him. But then around noon, the unthinkable happened. And her precious little boy, this miracle that was promised to her in her old age, this son of hers dies in her arms. Her head must have been swimming. It must have been swimming with thoughts and as she tried to come to grips with what had just happened. How can this be? Was this a cruel joke after all? I told Elisha not to toy with me. No, this can't be. What am I going to do? And then in a moment of great strength and faith, her thoughts became crystal clear. And she carried her son up to that room on the roof. And she laid him down in the prophet's bed. And then she walked out of the room and closed the door behind her. Then she calls to her husband. She doesn't tell him what's happened, but she calls to her husband and she says, send me one of your workers and a donkey. Hurry, hurry. I must go to the man of God. And then something really strange happened. The, the husband made this strange comment back to her and said, well, why are you going today? It's neither a new moon festival or the Sabbath. Because you see, it was it was." customary to visit a prophet only when there was a new moon festival or a Sabbath. But any other time would, would be highly unusual and, and likely frowned upon. But the woman said to her husband, it will be all right. And I wonder, I wonder, were these words an attempt to, to convince herself or did she sense something that no one else did? Were these the words of a strong woman determined to take matters into her own hands? Or were they an expression of her strong faith in God? God had granted her one miracle. He surely could grant her another one. So she saddled the donkey and she said to the servant, hurry, let's go. Don't slow down unless I tell you to. Keep moving, keep moving. And then as she and the servant were almost at their destination, as they came near to that man of God at Mount Carmel, Elisha saw them approaching from a distance. He saw them coming his way and and he began to get concerned. He says, look, the woman from Shunem is coming. Run out to meet her, he says to Gehazi. Run out to meet her and ask her, is everything all right with you and with your husband and with your child? And so Gehazi does just that. He runs out to meet the visitors and he inquires of the woman, is everything all right with you? Is everything all right with your husband and your child? And this woman says something strange at this point. She looks at him and she said, yes, everything's fine. And then she pushes past him and goes straight to the man of God. When she reached Elisha, she fell at his feet and she grabbed hold of his ankles and she would not let go. Gehazi even came and tried to push her away. But Elisha said, leave her alone. She is deeply troubled. But the Lord has not yet told me what her problem is. Then, a, then the woman in a, in a voice mixed with pain and anger and probably much confusion says to Elisha, 
Did I ask you for a son, my Lord? And didn't I say, don't deceive me and get my hopes up? How could you do this? How could you let this happen, Lord? And then with great concern and compassion, and maybe even a little bit of guilt, Elisha says to Gehazi, Take my staff and go, go, go as fast as you can. Don't stop and talk to anyone. And when you get there, take my staff and lay it on the face of that child. So Gehazi grabbed his cloak and he tucked it into his belt and he went running, ran as fast as he could, as fast as he could towards Shunem. But the boy's mother wouldn't have any of this. She did not let go of those ankles of Elisha's. And she insisted, as surely as the Lord lives and you yourself lives, Elisha, I will not go home unless you go with me. So at her insistence, Elisha returned with her. In the meantime, Gehazi has arrived in in Shunem and he's in the home and he goes upstairs to the guest room where he finds this child who is dead, lying on the bed of the prophet. And as instructed, he laid Elisha's staff on that child's face, but nothing happened. There was no sign of life. So with great sadness, he heads back to meet Elisha And when he finds him, he breaks the news. The child is still dead. Well, when Elisha arrives at the home, the child he sees is indeed dead, lying there on his bed. He went into the room by himself and he closed the door behind him and he began to pray. He began to pray to the Lord, pray for a miracle. And then he did a very strange thing, something that in our eyes seems very unorthodox and in these days we would say probably a little inappropriate. It's one of those things we we look at in the Bible and we think, hmm, this uh, this is different, this is different. Because Elijah takes his body and lays down on top of this child's body placing his mouth on the child's mouth, his eyes on the child's eyes, and his hands on the child's hands. And as he stretches out over this boy and begins to breathe into him in the name of God, the child's body begins to grow warm. So Elisha gets up and begins to pace back and forth across the room. And then he does it again. He stretches himself across that child But this time, the boy begins to sneeze. Not just once, but over and over again. He sneezed seven times. And then he opens his eyes. Then Elisha, certainly elated with much joy, calls for Gehazi and says, Bring the child's mother to me here at once. And when the woman came into the room, Elisha said, Here. Take your son. But she didn't take her son. The first thing she did was to bow down at Elisha's feet. She was overwhelmed with gratitude. Gratitude to him and gratitude to God. Then she took her son. She took him in her arms and she carried him downstairs It's an amazing and an unusual story, a story, like I said, many are not familiar with. But as I studied this story this week, in fact, I think we could probably do a month-long series on this story. There were so many things there, but there were several that that really stood out to me, and I want to share those with you this morning. Because the first thing that I notice about this woman is that she understands the importance of hospitality. In fact, if it were not for her hospitality, there would be no story, right? This is where her story began when she connected, when she extended her hand, when she 
gave the love of God and shared that with this man, and, and a relationship was built. And in that process, these two were both blessed. We place great importance here at Broad Street United Methodist Church on, on hospitality. We think it's an important thing, don't we? we? We put a lot of importance in that. We have, we have door greeters and we have coffee servers and we have, have uh, information and, and welcome desk staff. And we've even added parking lot greeters. We take it seriously. But even in that, and we can certainly use more people to do that, but even in that, Beyond those specific duties, each and every one of us is called to be hospitable. Not just to the people we know inside the church, not just to our friends, but to the people we don't know. And not just to people inside the church, but to people outside our walls, out there. We are called to reach out with a hand of hospitality and love to let them know that God loves them too. Are we paying attention? Are we extending hospitality at every opportunity like this Shunammite woman did? Think about it too. She didn't just do the bare minimum. She just didn't do a little something. She went all out. She built this room. She just didn't invite him for a meal. She built a room for him. And she just didn't just build a room. She put a bed. She furnished it. She furnished it with a table and a chair and a place for him to come and be comfortable. She went all out in her hospitality. But you know, sometimes I think we get busy. We come in the door. We want to see our friends. We want to talk to them. We want to catch up. And we forget about those that we don't know or the, that new person that may have just walked in the door. And so I hope that, that we could all begin to have the eyes of that Shunammite woman and that we would, would make a point to go and greet someone. In fact, I bet you in this very room, there is somebody that you, don't, you could not call their name, that you've never met, or maybe you've seen them here for a while and you've just been too embarrassed to walk up and say, I don't know your name. Well, I hope today that you'll get past that embarrassment. It's, it's, there's nothing to be embarrassed about. I have to do it out there every Sunday, and I've been here a year. But it happens. It happens. We have to do that to reach out and make each other feel part of things and, and feel connected. And so, so I think part of this story is about hospitality and what a difference that makes. But I also saw something else in this story it occurred to me that God sees our buried dreams, our dead and buried dreams. It was the dream of every married couple in those days, as it is for most married couples these days, to have children. But about back then, it was especially important to have a son. Yet the Shunammite woman and her husband had no children. They had lived a long, blessed life, and they had every material possession that they could possibly want. But the one thing that they wanted most of all, the one thing that money could not buy, was to have that son. So they had resigned themselves to the fact that this dream of theirs was not going to happen. They had buried that dream. I wonder if there's anyone here this morning that has an unfulfilled dream. Maybe you gave up on that dream a long time ago. Maybe you buried it so deep that you've almost forgotten about it. Maybe you've learned to live with the disappointment. Well, I want to say to you this morning to take heart that God sees your buried dream and although that dream may never come to fruition, may never be a reality, the truth is that God can and still does restore dreams. But you know what got my attention the most about this story? It was an ironic statement that I saw that just kept popping out at me. Remember that that when the Shunammite woman was rushing to Elisha 
to tell him about her son's death. She was stopped by Gehazi who asked her, is everything all right with you and your son and your husband? And she said to him, yes, everything is all right. And she ran past him to Elisha. But we know for a fact that everything was not right. This woman, whether she knew it or not, may have just made her greatest statement of faith. She was so deep and strong in her faith that that this may have even been just subconsciously. She may not even realize the, the, the words, her choice of words and what they meant. But I, I really think that there was meaning beyond her intent. You see, when her son, her promised gift from God was in her arms, when that son died tragically, she took that son upstairs She laid him on the prophet's bed, and she turned around and closed the door. She didn't tell her husband. She didn't tell him what had happened. She just turned around and closed the door. And it occurred to me that this woman, in a great act of faith, did not prepare her son's body for burial. She prepared his body for resurrection. She prepared his body for resurrection. Everything will be all right. Well, the story of the Shunammite woman has a happy ending. She received that second miracle that she had asked for, the resurrection of her son. But I imagine... In this very room today, some of you are thinking, why not me? Why didn't I get my miracle? Why? I had faith, I prayed for it, but it never happened. Why didn't God resurrect my child? Why didn't God heal my disease? Why did my spouse have to suffer Where was God when I lost the job that I loved and I needed desperately? Well, Friday, I was was out on the lake with a couple of friends up in Virginia. Two of my friends that I talk about a lot, that I hike with, and that you hear me speak of quite a bit. One of those women is a widow, and the other is divorced. We were out on the lake on, on kayaks, but, but we had stopped doing any work. We were kind of uh, floating and, and talking, and, and I began to share this story with them. I began to tell them that I was preaching on this Sunday, and I just wasn't sure where to land. Uh, what was the, the need? What was, what was important for me to share with everyone? So I asked them after I finished the story, what would you need to hear if you heard this story? And my friend who's a widow crossed her arms and she said, I would be sitting there saying, well, why not me? Why didn't God love me that much? Why didn't he give me that miracle? There was still pain there that she shared. And then I shared with her. Because immediately when she said that, I flashed back to the day that her husband died. He was a wonderful member of my congregation. I received a a frantic call from her from work that morning. She had just gotten a call that that something had happened to Roger. She was on her way home, but she worked 45 minutes away. I was at the church, and I was only five minutes away, so I assured her I was heading right there. I drove up the road to her house right behind the paramedics. And when I pulled down her long driveway and I saw Roger's lifeless body lying in his garden, a place that he loved to spend time, I began to pray with all my heart. God, we need a miracle. Please, God, we need a miracle now. But we didn't get that miracle. 
And I turned to my friend on Friday as we floated there on the lake and said what I know to be true and what I believe with all my heart, that God loves every one of us. And God's love for us is greater than we could ever imagine or even understand. And because that I know that God wants only the best for us, I can trust when what I want doesn't always happen. When what happens, because I know he wants best for us, when what happens isn't what I want, I have to believe that he knows better. But see, God sees the big picture. He sees what we don't see. And as I said to my friend, you know, we don't know what might have been ahead for Roger. And he actually got what most of us pray for. He went like that, doing what he loved to do best. It was hard for us. But we knew, we knew, and we could trust that, that this is what was best for him. And you know, when I don't get that miracle or my prayer isn't answered, I have to believe that that's what was best. I trust that God knows what is best and that that's what he wants for all of us. A few years ago, a church member said to me as, as they were preparing to undergo a, a very serious surgery, as I stood there in the hospital room with him and, and we had just prayed, I asked him, I said, how are you? And he said, I'm great. He said, I'm a winner either way. That's the kind of faith that I want to have. That's the kind of faith that my parents had. I remember... Well, let's see, it was 20 years ago that my father died, soon to be 21. He had battled kidney and bladder cancer for on and, off, on and off for probably 10 years. He endured dialysis three times a week for the last three years of his life. And on this particular day, when he and my mom sat in the doctor's office and the doctor looked at them and said, the cancer's back and it's inoperable and you probably have about six months to live, my dad grabbed my mom's hand they just looked at each other, and then they looked at the doctor, and they said, okay, so what do we do now? And they thanked him for what, that he had walked through this with them and, and that he would continue to help them. And he looked at them, and he said, boy, you two sure do take bad news well. And he was right. They could take that news like that because they knew. They knew that God was there with them and that God would walk through that with them and that God knew what was best. They had that faith that says, I am a winner either way. Their prayers, our prayers had been for a healing miracle. But they were absolutely sure that even if healing didn't come in this life, that there would be complete and perfect healing on the other side. Not only that, they knew and were assured that God would walk through this with them and he would never leave their side. Particularly in the last years, but, but, but quite often, even before that, my dad would say to us when we were fretting over something or upset about something or worried about something, he would say, everything's going to be all right. Everything's going to be all right my sisters and I still say that to each other today. And it's that same kind of faith, that faith of the Shunammite woman who didn't prepare her child for burial. She prepared him for resurrection. The woman that would not give up until her prayers were heard. It's that same kind of faith that we're getting ready to sing about in a few moments. In our, our hymn of response this morning, it's that kind of faith that it speaks to, that, that in the midst of dark times in our lives, when we are overcome with sorrow, that those who trust in the Lord, those who have a relationship with His Son, Jesus Christ, for them, for us, everything's going to be all right. 
it can still be well with our souls. I pray this morning that that you have that kind of faith, that you will trust God to do what's best for you and for your loved ones, even if your dead dreams are never resurrected, even when the pain and the heartache are unbearable, because even then, it can be well with your soul.